Welcome to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. This podcast is devoted to helping increase your daily exposure to God's Word with a short scripture reading and brief commentary on key ideas, themes, and theology in each chapter. Now please join your host, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today is October 17th, and today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 518. Now, just by way of reminder, every day I read from one chapter of God's Word, and then I offer a brief explanation of key ideas, themes, and the theology in that chapter. My goal is to get you into God's Word for about 5 to 20 minutes or so. So let's get to our reading today from Deuteronomy 5.18. Deuteronomy 5.18 says this, And you shall not commit adultery. Well, this is our reading today from Deuteronomy 5.18. Now, among the Ten Commandments, perhaps the law that we see treated with the least respect in the media today is the law prohibiting adultery. It is amazing how sex outside marriage has become such a trivial thing in our culture today. And considering how powerful the media is today, it should not surprise us that this peddling of adultery has influenced people's behavior too. Statistics are showing that this is indeed the case, even within the church. And the seventh command says this, and you shall not commit adultery. In the Old Testament, the word adultery does not cover all forms of sexual sin. It refers to sexual intercourse in which at least one person is married or betrothed. Other forms of sexual sin are discussed in Deuteronomy 22. The punishment for adultery in the Old Testament is death. Whereas in the ancient Near East, adultery was considered a sin only against the other partner in marriage. The Bible states that it is regarded as a sin against God, as both Joseph and David have stated in Genesis 39, 9 and Psalm 51, 4. Nathan, declaring God's word to David about the king's adultery, said this in 2 Samuel 12, 10. You have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Peter Craigie points out that the reason why adultery is singled out for attention in the Decalogue is because adultery, more than other illicit behaviors, has to do with unfaithfulness in a relationship of commitment. Later, the idolatry and the religious apostasy of Israel were described as adultery in Isaiah 57, 3, Jeremiah 3, 8 through 9, Ezekiel 23, 43, and Isaiah 2, 2. That is, the marriage tie mirrors the tie between God and his people. It has to do with that all-important aspect of human life, binding commitments to God and to spouse. In fact, the seriousness of adultery lay in the fact that the family was an absolutely vital aspect of the covenant community of God within the community of Israel. So much of God's will for his people is achieved through the family. The Bible takes the principle of commitment that lies behind God's covenant relationship with humans and the covenant relationship between a man and his wife very seriously. To violate that principle is to violate the way that God works with humans. This is a very serious crime. Earlier, God included honoring parents in the Ten Commandments, as that too is part of this God and family tie included in the covenant with Israel. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20, Paul presents another strong reason why adultery is so serious. It's based on the fact that there is a very close tie between Christ and our bodies. He emphasizes this point through four statements in this one paragraph, stating this in verse 13. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Verse 15, your bodies are members of Christ. Verse 17, he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Verse 20, so because of this union between Christ and our bodies, Paul says, so glorify God in your body. Sexual relations make two bodies into one, says Paul, quoting the often quoted words from the institution of marriage in Genesis 2.24, which says, the two will become one flesh. And so relations between man and wife are an aspect of our relationship with Christ, and therefore it is part of the body being one with Christ. But if one commits adultery, the body belonging to Christ becomes one with somebody in a way that violates the oneness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.16 says, Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? So 
the person has rejected Christ and has replaced him with a prostitute. Paul says that the damage done through adultery is even more serious than other sins done with the body. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Other sins, such as drunkenness, are also sins against the body. But adultery does this in a unique way in that the body becomes one in the fullest sense with the other person when it should be one only with Christ. And Christ detests this oneness through adultery. All this would not make sense if we did not fully grasp that the believer's body is one with Christ. Say the principal of the school is in the front seat of a vehicle while a student of the school drives that vehicle. What if the student screams obscenities at the other drivers while driving and breaks all the road rules? What an insult to the principal that would be. Adultery heaps an even greater insult on Christ, which can only be committed by kicking Christ out of the car, i.e. our body. Now, David was told this in 2 Samuel 12, 10. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, the Lord, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And that is what happened to David. His relationship with the Lord was restored, and so was the joy of salvation for which he asked in his heartfelt psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, 12. But his family history after the adultery is one of serious strife. This is so today. The spouse is deeply hurt and even lives with a wound all over life. Children not only live with a wound, they often live with anger and shame over what their parent did. And although God forgets when he forgives our sins, people often don't. And that could be a scar on the person's reputation. Then there is the other person involved in the idolatrous act. That person is usually wounded deeply. A pastor committed adultery with a young girl, but was subsequently restored to his wife and to his ministry following genuine repentance. But he found out many years later that the girl had become a prostitute. Truly sad, because it wasn't dealt with biblically. That man needed to repent, and he needed a period of time, maybe never to return to ministry ministry again. Now, the Bible often uses the threat of eternal consequences when appealing to people to abstain from adultery. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Immediately after that, he says this in Colossians 3, 6, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Again, writing to the Corinthians, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 8, We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. Earlier, he had said that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Finally, there is the effects that adultery has on a church or organization, especially in when it is committed by the leader of that organization or church. And that is to say people are confused and discouraged. They say the reason is if he can't make it, what hope is there for us? There's disillusionment over and anger against the leadership as the members feel that they've been let down. And when the leadership proceeds to discipline the wrongdoer or fails to do so adequately, the unity breaks as the members usually divide into groups. Some agree with the action taken and others don't. I have never seen a disciplinary process for adultery that has gone well into the satisfaction of everybody. This always leaves behind a lot of hurt and angry people. Now, using a word for fleeing from danger, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. We're to avoid it like the plague. We are to run away from it like running away from a forest fire or a wild animal waiting to devour us. It's absolutely dangerous. And when we're tempted, we must run away from it and tear. Now the attitude of abhorrence of idolatry in the Bible sharply contrasts with the casual attitude towards adultery today. Research has demonstrated that sex is not a biological necessity, and so abstinence does not harm people according to a worldly standard. But today, sex is considered an almost a necessary aspect of adult life. The extent to which sex outside marriage has become acceptable in society is illustrated by an episode involving an Australian teenage boy who was dying of cancer. He was a virgin and some people felt that he should experience having sexual intercourse with a woman before he died. So after a lot of controversy, the authorities gave permission for him to have a time alone with a woman for this purpose. What a contrast this is to the biography of Bible teacher John Stott. 
stop single. And the book talked about his having to deny sexual desires because of his singleness. But there was no sense of regret by Stott. Rather, there was immense joy for the full life God had given him. Western Christians today must know that militant Muslims believe they are fighting God's battle to prevent the invasion of Western values into the Islamic community. One of these values that they detest is a casual attitude towards sex, even in official circles. The media reports as as something quite normal that famous people, many of them heroes to our youth, are living together, though they are not married to each other. Philip Riken quotes some research that shows that with all the encounters, all the in and windows, the average American views sexual material more than 10,000 times per year. Riken states that by a ratio of more than 10 to 1, the couplings on television involve sex outside of marriage. One TV producer explained the reason for this, saying this, the marriage or celebrate characters aren't much fun, he says. A famous Indian actress, when interviewed by the Times of India, said monogamy is weird. One is boring. Novels also thrive on adultery. It's into this environment that Christians can lose their sense of horror over adultery. Then when temptation hits them with great force, they may not have the moral strength to resist it. Statistics seem to show that this has indeed started to happen and is continuing to worsen in today's church. Often the sins common in society find expression in the church too. The most serious sexual sin that appears in the New Testament came from the church in Corinth, a city well known for sexual license. But Paul did not give the slightest hint of of condoning it. He told them that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. He rebuked the Corinthian church for not taking severe steps against a member who has committed sexual sin in 1 Corinthians 5. As in the Old Testament, Paul used the threat of punishment for sin as a deterrent to adultery in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 and Colossians 3, 5 through 6. If the church was more faithful in warning its members of this reality, people would be more cautious about extramarital sex. One of the first thoughts that came to me as I read about the dying Australian boy in his sexual experience was the words of Paul that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. This was certainly not a good way to prepare that youth for death. If the church had been more vocal about its belief in the consequences of idolatry, perhaps the authorities would have been more cautious about permitting that youth to have sex with a woman. When the prophet Nathan confronted David about his adultery, he implied that the adultery was a statement of his dissatisfaction with all the blessings that God had showered on him. 2 Samuel 12, 7-8 says this, Thus says the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Now Nathan viewed this as despising the word of the Lord, saying this in 2 Samuel 12, 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? Now, whenever Christians break the law of God, they are declaring that God is unable to satisfy them, and therefore they are forced to disobey God. God is perfectly capable of giving people life to the full, according to John 10.10. Those who follow God can be satisfied with life, whether they are married or single, widowed or divorced. Those who seek satisfaction through adultery have been trapped into thinking that they need extramarital sex in order to live a satisfied life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. To seek satisfaction from things that violate God's law is idolatry. We trusted in God because we believe that he would fulfill our deepest yearnings. Those who commit adultery are saying that extramarital sex can give satisfaction that God cannot give. This is the same as replacing God with an idol. Paul shows that there's a close connection between idolatry and sexual sin in Romans 1, 25 through 27 in Colossians 3, 5. God promises to satisfy us so that we can say with Paul in Philippians 4, 11, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. 
While Paul was talking here about economic need, the principle applies to every situation. We must pursue this contentment and joy that God gives us. Single Christians may miss some of the joys of marriage, but God promises a full life, and that promise in John 10.10 applies to them also. They need to seek the fullness through enjoying God and friends and family and quote-unquote children from the Christian community whom God will give them. The church must ensure that singles have opportunities to receive these blessings. But even if the church fails them, God can give them a fulfilled life. They do not need to result to adultery for satisfaction. Married people need to pursue the joy that God wishes for them to have from him and through their spouse. This will mean that they will have to carefully nurture their marriage so that being with their spouse becomes a delightful experience. George Mueller writes, I never saw my beloved wife at any time when I met her unexpectedly in Bristol without being delighted to do so. Martin Luther says there is no more lovely, friendly, or charming relationship, communion, or company than a good marriage. And given priority to our marriage relationship is one of the best deterrents to idolatry. Paul says this about the need for married couples to have regular sexual relations in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, which says, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come again together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. We know that some people who work very hard and do not give sufficient time to their home have fallen into adultery, often with people in their workplace. Sadly, this has happened to many Christian workers. Hermas, who was probably an early second century church father, said, guard your chastity. If you always remember your own wife and you will never sin, he says, this is something we must be careful to do. You see, if we get careless about nurturing our marriages, it is very easy to fall into the trap of Satan. I have heard of Christian men who have told women who were not their spouse that their wives do not satisfy them, and therefore they would like a special relationship with these women. Well, that is usually a lie. But even if it's not a lie, an unhappy marriage is never an excuse for an affair. God is able to give a fulfilled life even to those in unhappy marriages. Besides, an affair will never give this person the satisfaction that they seek. You cannot rebel against God and expect to be satisfied. People in an adultery relationship do not go into them because their marriages are unhappy they go into them because they have been disobedient to god and to his laws and have succumbed to temptation in his sermon on the mount jesus went to the root cause of adultery saying this in matthew 5 28 but i say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart now, in today's world where the idea of women looking at men lustfully as being aggressively peddled in the media, we should, in the application of Matthew 5.28, include the possibility of women lusting after men, too. Earlier in previous times, we had lists of the most beautiful women and the most handsome men in the world. Now the list of the sexiest men and women are more popular today than ever. The idea of these lists is that you can enjoy their sexuality, which the Bible confines to the marriage tie between one man and woman for life. Now the word of God is clear. Don't look at women lustfully, and yet the world says that you're right. Next, Jesus shows how serious sexual purity is by recommending dramatic action to overcome temptation and avert judgment for sexual sin, saying this in Matthew 5, 29-30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you should lose one of your members than your whole body should be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. You see, when we get sexual satisfaction through looking at somebody who is not our spouse, we're committing adultery. This is such a serious thing, and its consequences are so dangerous that it would be better to be without something considered essential, like an eye or a hand, if that is what it takes to stay away from it. No one falls into idolatry suddenly. There has been a process of compromise of which the physical act is a climax. The compromise involves sins of the mind where illicit pleasure was obtained from things or persons from whom are not permitted to get sexual pleasure. 
the media today is bombarding us with messages that we have the right to find sexual satisfaction from people beside our spouse. And so we are constantly exposed to sexually stimulating images in advertising and on social media. The idea is, is that given the plethora of messages people are exposed to in this media age, the advertisers can attract our attention by giving us a sexually stimulating image and they rarely fail to get the desired response from the viewer. The fashion world is peddling its wares by using blatant sexuality. The sexiness of the sexiest men and women in our polls today and on lists in our magazines are presented not only to their spouses, but to the general public. And in this atmosphere, is it possible to not commit adultery in the heart? Well, 1 John 1, 7 through 1 John 2, 22 are very helpful to this point. John says that there's no excuse for a Christian to sin in 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing you these things to you so that you may not sin. We must never condone looking at a member of the opposite sex lustfully, even though everybody, quote unquote, may do it. Christians have no license to do that. But sadly, many Christians do yield to this temptation. And so John goes on to say that God has made provision for that in 1 John 2, 1 through 2. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He has a propitiation for our sins. So how can we avail of God's provision for our sin? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteous. So we must confess them. And the word confess is the translation of the Greek word homologio, which is translated literally means to say the same thing. We face up squarely to the seriousness of our sin. We confess what we did. We agree with God. We tell God that we looked at this person lustfully and that we're sorry for it. and We wish not to do it again. This way we bring it to the surface exactly what we did without diminishing the seriousness of it. And once it's been brought to the surface, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin in 1 John 1, 7. Now, Satan does not like us to recover from this sin. Therefore, he tries to convince us that it is useless to confess it, to repent of it, that will never make it to purity. And this paralyzes us spiritually, and we live defeated lives. Having given up the fight, we do not strive towards the wonderful things that God has planned for us. Instead, we may go deeper and deeper into impurity. We must show people how great grace is and warn them of Satan's attempt to make them ineffective by keeping them from availing themselves of God's grace revealed in the word of God. We must be constantly aware of the real possibility and in falling into the traps laid out for us by the media and the, by actual people of the other sex, especially those who have dressed indiscreetly. And if we fall into this trap, we must face up squarely to the fact that we have sinned against God. We won't say something like, and we shouldn't say something like this. What could I do considering that I'm exposed to these images and videos constantly? If there is no total confession of a wrong, along with the decisive repudiation of the act, we will live with the guilt of the action and also some vestiges of the sin in our lives. This will make us vulnerable to further sin. And if we keep on giving in to the temptation to look lustfully, our minds will be so impure that given the proper conditions, it could result in a physical act of adultery. We know how much more vulnerable we are today when this incident took place because of the the easy access to pornography on the internet. And in view of the above dangers, it would be wise for Christians to have at least one person to whom they're accountable about this. Ideally, they should have an accountability group. This seems to be implied in 1 John 1, 7, where before stating that the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin, John says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The context is talking about confession of sin, and therefore we can interpret the walking in the light that opens the door to fellowship as referring to being honest with our sins. And to be clear, only a man should be honest with another man about his sexual sin, and only a woman should talk to a woman about their sexual sin. 
Now, sex is a part of life in which we are all vulnerable to temptation. Therefore, it is imperative that we always remain on guard against the enemy. As Proverbs 4.23 says, we are to guard our hearts with all due diligence. From, from it flows the issues of life. It is dangerous for anybody to think that they are above temptation in the area of sexual sin. Some who talk in this way may in fact be lying and living contrary to the grace of God revealed in the word. Today, as Christians, we must walk in the light, and that involves accountability with others in our local churches, a man with a man and a woman with a woman, where men are walking with one another and women are walking with one another so that we may all walk worthy of the calling that we've received from the Lord. Well, I want to thank you for listening or watching today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave. My name is Dave, and today is October 17th, and we've looked at Deuteronomy 5.18. Until tomorrow, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Reading the Bible Daily with Dave podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, or follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, X, or YouTube. We appreciate your support.